<sighs> so this is, this is how it begins. There were a lot of folks who were getting close to Jesus. Those who, who weren't fulfilled and, and sinners wanted to hear him. And the Pharisees and the legal experts, oh, and I like this word, diagongudzon. It's a word for grumbling, diagongudzon. And it's the, it's the grumbling that they did in the desert because they were slaves and they had, to, they had to mix straw in the bricks, and they had to do all the work, and then this great and wonderful God freed them, and they went out into the desert, and they thought Pharaoh was going to catch them, but the Red Sea parted, and the people went on through, and the Pharaoh's army got drowned, and I know we're not supposed to cheer for, for the bad fortune of others, but, but it's hard not to when you're scared to the core of your being, and you're on the other side of the Red Sea, and then you diagongudzon, you grumble because you're tired of having manna every day. Because you've seen all these miracles, and I'm a little thirsty, and I'm hoping that this mighty God hasn't forgotten how to make water come out of the rock. That's the kind of grumbling. Not, not grumbling from people who who are feeling the bombs fall all around them. Not grumbling from people who, who know the money runs out around the 21st of the month and the cupboard's already bare. This is grumbling from people who have experienced God's blessings to the fullest. <sighs> now, what we want Jesus to do is to turn to these grumblers and say, you guys are full of beans. You guys are fat and sassy. And you don't know what it's like to be lost in the darkness and need a light. But instead, Jesus was smarter than I am. I would have told him off and messed it up. It says, and he told them this parable. He told them this story. Don't forget what the word parable means. It's mathematical, and this is all the mathematics I know. I majored in the humanities. A parabola, you start close to yourself, and you go way out here, but you end up coming right back where you started. Jesus tells a story. Actually, he tells three stories. The story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin. We all understand when we've lost a possession. We all understand when we're looking for cash and we're not sure what pocket we put it in. And maybe he did those two first because now he's getting to the story of the lost child. Now, we're still telling that story 2,000 years later because it's so real. Because it's us. I know. Your grandkids never took off. We've got a runner. You get away with a lot when your grandfather's the minister. <laughs> now, we call it the story of the prodigal son. But prodigal's a word in English. It doesn't say prodigal here. And, and a lot of times, I think we, we assume prodigal is a synonym for sinner. And it's not. The Oxford English Dictionary has, has, has a definition that extends in tiny print across a couple columns, but it comes down to this. A prodigal is somebody who is a waster. 
who wastes extravagantly. We should call this the parable of the economic sociopath. I'm so proud of that phrase, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> we should call this parable the parable of the economic sociopath. Because it makes more sense to us. We all know what it's like to squeeze a nickel so hard that Thomas Jefferson burps. We don't like to let go of anything. When we from Napanee area, from Elkhart County, go to the big city and discover that not only do they want us to pay for parking, but it's going to cost us $25 to turn our car off, we're astounded. And we decide we're going to stay here. I'll never forget an annual conference, the time, and this will date me, Art Gish. The man who preached the simple life got up in the middle of annual conference and said, a $5 chicken dinner is an abomination unto the Lord. <laughs> Boy, good luck finding a $5 chicken dinner today, even if you buy the chicken yourself and cook it. What made? What made this economic sociopath, what he was. Because nobody's a villain in their own mind. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to be as evil as I can be. There really is no snidely whiplash that goes, nah, I, I'm going to put Fairnell, tie her up on the train tracks. Nah, I, I. It's a little Dudley do-right for those who don't remember that cartoon. That was before Japanese cartoons, kids. Anyway, the family's unbalanced. Horribly unbalanced. So unbalanced that the younger son says to his father, give me my share of the inheritance when you're not even dead. The father has not even had a chance to put a bumper sticker on the motorhome saying, we're spending our kids' inheritance. Of course, the way this story, the story starts should give us a warning. There was a man who had two sons. That's bad news. What happens when there's, yeah, what happens when there's two sons in the Bible? How long did Cain hate his brother? As long as he was able. I'm sorry. I've been saving that one, and I now used it. <laughs> but Isaac got the better of his brother Ishmael. Jacob cheated Esau. Not this Jacob. Jacob cheated Esau out of his inheritance. And Joseph, Joseph had the ultimate revenge. He not only outshone all his brothers, but they were financially dependent on him in the midst of a terrible famine. They owed him. He had power over them. Having family members, brothers or sisters, means conflict, especially even in, even in the best of situations. But when a family becomes out of balance, it gets further and further out of control. Each week, I'm going to try to talk about a different character in this story, but in a way, I have to mention all of them all the time. We don't see the mother here in this story. Is she simply not able to function? Is she gone? Is she dead? Has she left? We don't know. But now we know that we have an older brother who feels he has to take the weight of the world on his shoulders and do more than anybody else. There's rights and responsibilities, and he's taking all the responsibilities. Maybe the younger brother never measures up. Maybe whenever he tries to help around the farm, the older brother has to redo it so it's better. 
And we have a father who's letting it happen. Maybe because of his grieving heart, he wants only good things. And it's not possible to always have good things. We have to do some of our responsibilities as our rights. The thing is, as we get unbalanced, we begin to become more polarized. It gets worse and worse if we leave it alone. To the point that, that the, brothers, the older brother is working so hard when a party's going on at his home, he's not even aware of it until he comes back in from the field. It's so out of balance that when, when a younger son leaves, the father's still at home, not even going out after him, just frozen, unable to figure out what's the right thing to do. And then there's a younger son who's not able to balance present pleasure and the thought of even better things in the future. You know, he, he wasn't raised a servant. He wasn't raised a slave. He wasn't raised a pauper. His father has land, and land, land is money, land is power, but you don't liquidate the land. You never get it back. Now, one of the things we don't realize is when the younger son asks for his portion, he doesn't get half. According to the scriptural law, he gets a third. The older brother gets two-thirds. So right away, it isn't fair. Family life is not fair. Babies are not fair. A baby demands all your attention, and a baby doesn't do anything for the household other than give joy by its presence. But, you know, as, as time goes by, we should be requiring the young child to do a few things around the house or around the farm until it is, it is not only necessary but a joy to be able to do more to contribute, to be praised for the work you did, and to want on your own to take on more. We grow into the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But this brother decides he wants his one-third of the farm. And by the way, according to Jewish law, if you get it early, it's kind of like cashing in your 401k early. There's a penalty. He doesn't get, get one-third or three-ninths. He gets two-ninths. So he's even losing out more. He's cashing in his retirement now. Even then, what we'd like to think is, is that he has a dream, that he wants to purchase a business, or that he has a passion, and, and cashing this in will allow him to accomplish it. But what he does is he goes to a far country. That's the phrase that's there. He goes far away. He leaves Napanee. And does he go to L.A. or Chicago or New York where he might have a fresh start? One of the things I liked about living in Los Angeles is if you were, you were tired of people making fun of what you did in kindergarten, if you were tired of always being known for having struck out in the bottom of the ninth at the sectional, if you, if you had something that happened to you, you could, in L.A., you became a new person by moving a half mile, north, south, east, or west. Nobody knows you. They don't care about your past. They just want to know who you are now. But he doesn't go to there. He goes to Las Vegas. He goes to Las Vegas, and this is what gets brethren, I think, most of all. He spends it on wine, women, and loud, happy song. That was... I remember that. Wine, women, and loud, happy song. I had all three, but none lasted long. That's on one of Ringo Starr's albums, but it's really an old song. So you can look it up. He spends it all, not even thinking of the future. Everything is so out of balance. Everything is so polarized that, that it doesn't even occur to him that you should always keep bus fare in your pocket. And then when it's gone, we have this inconvenient truth 
about the weather, the climate doesn't s act in a way to suit us and our politics. The climate doesn't act in a way in accordance with our economic status. A famine descends, as it says, a great famine, and he begins to starve. The actual Greek says his colon is empty. It's always grosser in the Greek. <laughs> and then he begins to think, finally. You know, sometimes you have to hit rock bottom. Sometimes, in order to begin to become balanced, in order to begin to realize what's wrong, you have to really hit rock bottom. Not all of us. Some of us just have to bump against a wall. And we go, oh, I'm okay. I got my lesson. Some of us just have to bump into each other before we realize we got to make a change. Sometimes it's just looking in the mirror. But for some people, it's rock bottom. And the thing is, he begins to ask some serious questions. Now, here's where I get a little cynical. He says, Every, all the servants at my father's house, all the slaves get three meals a day. I'll go back and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. I am not worthy to be your son. Let me be one of your hired hands. Now, I wonder if in the back of his head he's thinking, Dad won't let me do that. He already knows Dad is too permissive. He already knows dad has always let him get his way. Maybe he's thinking, but the thing is he doesn't know. It's a risk. And so in the midst of his despair, in the midst of his starvation, he comes to himself. Now that is a medical term in Greek. He comes to himself. It's what happens when you faint and you begin to re return to consciousness. It's what happens when you've had a tremendous physical blow and you begin to come who you are again. It recognizes that it is possible for us to be so distant from ourselves that we require a journey to return. Some of us have hit our heads and seen stars. Some of us have fainted. And maybe... Some of us emotionally have felt so distant from whom we wanted to be, so traumatized that we needed to know, we needed to travel back to ourselves. He finds himself, he arises, and here's the part, this is why Jesus told a story, because we get to fill in the blank. He comes home. He comes home from a far country. He has no money and no food. I don't, and there's a famine. I don't think he got to pick fruit or new strawberries or a little bit of grain on the way because there was a famine in the land. So I think he learned on the way back that there are strangers who will help you. We don't have that part of the story, but I want you to think as well about people who have helped you, total strangers, who changed your tire, filled your tank, or got you a room when you needed it. I want you to think about that untold part of your life where the least likely person turned out to be the most giving. And that restores some of the balance when we realize how much we depend on others and therefore how much we need to give. I always wonder if maybe part of the problem was the younger son just hadn't been balanced before himself. Uh, recently, Rhonda and I went to a, a day-long workshop called the, called the Whole Brain Child. And, you know, it, it's easy to simplify, so this is a simplification. But we often think of the right part of the brain where there's logical thinking and the left part where there's, there's more intuitive thinking, and on both sides there's emotion, but the point is we, we, we want to be in balance. Sometimes we use a little more of our logical part of our brain, sometimes we use a little more intuitive, creative, 
But if somebody doesn't have access at all to the logical part, or if somebody's so logical like the older brother, they don't have access to the more creative, the more pleasure-seeking part. And remember, it's in the Bible. Can, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. God wants us to have joy and pleasure and good times. And, and, and right in the middle is this part of the brain that just has to, it's the reason why young men pay more insurance until they're 25 and young women get to have the better rates a lot earlier. There's this part that's growing that says, eh, is that a good idea? And at some point we start listening to that. But maybe with this trauma, it's becoming into balance. And, and, he, and he's coming home. And of course, here's where they get to the part we're familiar. The father sees him, even though he's been declared dead by his son, told you don't matter, insulted by demanding his part of the inheritance. The father rushes out with joy and doesn't ask questions. You know, there's times... There's a time for saying, now I hope you've learned your lesson about all this. There's a time for describing what needs to be done or not. And there's a time for joy where we simply reach out and say, you were dead and now you're alive. You were lost and now you're found. We all get unbalanced in different ways at different times. Often it's from trauma, childhood trauma, adult trauma, disappointment, missing people in our lives, people who we trusted who betrayed us. There's probably not a person sitting here which isn't broken in some way or another. There's an extraordinary unfairness to life that makes you, makes you want to ask God, just, just why are you doing this? Why are some people seemingly not wired the way they need to be for the situation that you have thrown them in? And the very fact that we would ask God that question means we're on the right track because it means we're treating God as being real. Not just as this kindly figure over here that we turn into every once in a while and tell our good things. Oh, God, I'm so glad you're there. I'm praising you. Isn't it wonderful? And when I'm having a bad time, I'm going to wait and come back to you when I'm having a good time. Oh, God, it's so great. And I think that's part of our unbalance as well. Is our inability to keep God in our lives as the center, as the anchor, as the balancer. In our lives, sports schedules keep us away from church. And the obligations we imagine because we think our children have to do everything, so we'd better never tell them no. This has been the case as long as I've been a minister. In my first church, we had a little bus service, and we'd go around the community and bring people in for Sunday school. And once they became part of the soccer all-star team, it was over. Because from then on, every weekend they'd be gone playing soccer. How about the rest of us? There's times when you have to miss church. You need a Sabbath. But there's times when you have to say, there's a lot of things I need to do. The field needs planting. A, a lawn needs mowing. Garden needs tending. But we need to keep God in the middle through worship, through prayer, through Bible study, through Bible reading, or simply by serving God in whatever ministry we're called to. Because we already know it's so easy to get unbalanced. We know it's so easy to be alienated from each other. That it's easy to become a nation in which we claim that God is at the center and that God loves us and that we put God first and then we can't even talk to somebody because we're red and they're blue, or they're blue and we're, we're blue and they're red. We have half of the country that can't talk to each other. 
and both sides thinking they're people of faith. In the end, there's the voice as in the hymn. Come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. We're weary. Come home. And come next week and learn a little more about the Father in this story as well. We're so used to thinking of him, oh, he's perfect. He welcomes him back. But he's not. Any more than the younger son or the older brother is perfect any more than we're perfect. But if we're not perfect, the blessing is we serve a perfect God who says, come home. Amen.